constant maze in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene. And I wonder how he could love me, a sinner condemned so unclean. That's why I stay.
perfect and an upright man. He was godly in all of his ways. The devil thought he could have his soul if he could just take his possessions all away. So he stripped him of all of his riches. He took his family and he left him all alone. But Job said, my Redeemer lived and it is well with my soul. It is well with my soul. Oh, it is well, it is well with my soul. Swords may come, the winds may blow, but this one thing is sure I know. This old body, ever since the fall of mankind, there's twisted the lightnings on that too, and worries and trouble in your mind. Oh, but if you belong to Jesus, I always promise you can stand. He said, I'll never ever learn you, but I can take you from the master's hand. Oh, yeah. Jonah, and he left them 
in the party. In some ways, the message that I'm going to share with you today is kind of weighty. But I, I feel led, I felt led to, do, to preach this sermon. It has changed over the week as the Lord has dealt with me over this. But I knew, I knew what the Lord wanted me to preach. Uh, but the direction of this has changed throughout the week. And some of you who have preached and taught understand what I'm saying there. Um, as the Lord begins to direct your path in that. But today I want to talk to you about the sign of Jonah. The sign of Jonah. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, that we can turn to your word in every situation. We can turn to your word, Lord. Whatever's going on in our lives, whatever's going on in the world, we can turn to your word for answers. And so, Lord, I thank you, Father, that you've given us your word today. Lord, may I speak your words today. Holy Spirit, speak to me. Lord, lead and guide me today. And Lord, I pray, Father, that we would find peace and liberty in your word today. Challenge us through your word today. And we'll give you all the praise. We'll give you all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. There are many things going on in the world today. I don't need to tell you that. Unless you've been living under a rock for the last month, you know that there are many things going on in the world today. And you know that tomorrow, many people are anticipating this eclipse that is going on. So let's just talk about that and address the elephant in the room, if you will. That there will be an eclipse tomorrow. Okay? April 8th, there will be an eclipse. Now, I'm not here to tell you for certain. I'm not speaking as a prophet today. I'm here to share the Word of God with you. I am going to share some events and some things that have been happening with you, and I'll let you decide what you want to decide. I'll share some things with you, and you decide whether that's a sign of the times or whether these are signs of the times or not. And many of you have heard a lot of these things. There's a lot of things going on through social media. A lot of things are hyping things, uh, in my opinion, a lot more than what they should be. And many people are uh, downgrading these things a lot less than, in my opinion, what they should be. But, but it's up to you to decide as you study the Word. Are these the signs of the times? We had an eclipse in 2017. It went through several towns named Salem. We know as we study the Word that Salem is, is, the, is what Jerusalem used to be known as. And Salem, Jerusalem, is what Jerusalem is today. It's a place of peace. So many people saw that as a sign of the times in 2017, but now we have an eclipse in 2024 that will happen tomorrow that is visible, that goes across the United States and crosses the path of where that 2017 eclipse went. And as it goes across that path, there are going to be seven cities, seven towns or cities in America that will visibly be able to see at least a partial part of that eclipse and by the name, by those names of Nineveh of those towns. There's also a Jonah, Texas, that it will pass through. So as we're looking at those things, you decide whether that should be a sign to us. By the way, there's an eighth Nineveh that goes through Nova that goes through in Nova Scotia, Canada as well. Where the path of these two eclipses would intersect to create an X would be in the town of Carbondale, Illinois, which is also known as Little Egypt. Now we know Egypt saw darkness for three days as one of the plagues that they had. This eclipse is happening on 4-8. Exodus 4, Exodus 4, 8 says, Then it will be if they do not believe you, nor heed the message of the first sign, many people are interpreting this, as being the 2017 eclipse, 
that they may believe the message of the latter sign. Again, many people are interpreting this as the 2024 eclipse, saying it's not a coincidence that it's happening on 4 8. I'll let you decide. Where their paths intersect is right in the center of the New Madrid earthquake zone. In 1811, an earthquake happened just three months after the eclipse in September of 1811. It caused devastation for a 200 mile radius, even caused the Mississippi River to run backwards. And now we have X marks the spot at Little Egypt, which is in the middle of the New Madrid zone. Or what some people that pronounce things better than me say, New Madrid zone. I'm not telling you there's going to be an earthquake. I'm not telling you that God is warning us of stuff. But I'll let you decide. The eclipse will also be right above the constellation of Cetus. Or Cetus. In English, that word, we translate at, at that as whale. It crosses over the path of the area where trillions of cicadas will plague that region by the end of April. On the same day of the eclipse, a comet the size of Mount Everest will be visible as well. The name of this comet? The Mother of Dragons Comet, or otherwise known as Devil Comet. This comet only appears every 70 years. At the same time of this eclipse, the planets will be aligned. NASA will be shooting rockets into the eclipse to test the temperatures. Test the temperatures. The rockets are named after the Egyptian god of darkness. Again, I'll let you decide. On the same day, CERN will be running their particle accelerator. This large, what they call a large hadron collider, looking for the God particle, the secret particle that powers our earth. I've already found it. Yeah. I've already found the one that powers this earth. Uh, his spirit lives inside of me. I've already found him. Their own director of CERN, General Rolf Hauer, has given interviews to the British press in which he admits that they want to open the door to another dimension. That's the purpose of this. He said when we open the door, something might come through it into our reality or we might send something through it into their reality. Doesn't sound like something you want to play around with. But I'll let you decide. There was an earthquake in Taiwan just a few days ago. Now we could say any of these things, but by themselves, and one or two of them things could be a coincidence. And maybe you're here today and say all, all of the, I'm just giving you some of the things today because I do have a message to give you. I didn't come with current events for you. I came with this first so that I can, so you can understand the message that I have for you today. But I came to, with this first to help you to understand that somebody somewhere might just be trying to tell us something. Several earthquakes in California. Most of us know also about the earthquake in New Jersey. That just happened to be a 4.8 magnitude that took place right outside of Lebanon County and was strong enough to be felt in New York City and make the Statue of Liberty shake, by the way, the day before that the Statue of Liberty was struck by lightning. The epicenter of this earthquake was at a place called White House Station. But I'll, I'll just let you decide. Because this happened the day after the sec our, our Secretary of State demanded immediate ceasefire in Gaza. And he demanded that, if you don't know what's going on in the world today, of Israel. While we speak, Iran is threatening war with Israel and even attacks on the U.S. 
Russia and Ukraine have heated things up recently. Wars and rumors of wars are heating up throughout the world. Could this be some of the signs Jesus warned about? Or are these just coincidences? I'll leave that up to you to judge. But I'll tell you this, in Luke chapter 21, starting in verse 25, Jesus says, And there will be signs in the sun, in the moon, and in the stars. And on the earth, distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them from fear, and the expect expectation of those things which are coming on the earth. For the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Now when these things begin to happen, look up! Lift up your heads because your redemption draws near. But take heed to yourselves in verse 34, lest your hearts be weighed down with carousing, drunkenness, and cares of this life, that in that day come on you unexpectedly. In other words, he's telling us, my people, don't get caught up in the things of this world because I'm coming back. And don't get caught up when you start to see these things in the things of this world because you might just get left behind. Be ready. For it will come as a snare on all those who dwell on the face of the whole earth. Watch therefore and pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things that will come to pass and stand before the Son of Man. I said all that to say this, that some of you, that might cause you some anxiety. For some of you, you might feel fear creeping in again as I read those things to you. But my Bible says that you should not have the spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. As a matter of fact, it says that God did not give you the spirit of fear. So if we're experiencing fear today because of these things, we should not. We should do what Jesus said and said, look up because your redemption draws nigh. That's a reason to rejoice this morning. That's a reason to be excited this morning because as we see the signs that are happening, of course, I'll let you decide. But if, as we see the things that could be the signs that God is giving us today, as we see these signs, it doesn't give the church a reason to fear. It gives the church a reason to rejoice. Because whether it happens tomorrow, or it happens a week from now, or it happens ten years from now, or it happens a hundred years from now, and our grandchildren will experience it, one day Jesus is coming back. So we don't have to fear the things of this world. There will be a resurrection as we celebrated last week. But there will be a resurrection of our bodies too as we lift up out of the ground. Or some of us while we're alive, while we are alive, we'll be caught up in the air with Him. We don't need to fear. We need to rejoice because we see the signs that Jesus told us about. Hallelujah! But if we're not living as God would have us to live, oh, I wouldn't be preaching the whole gospel. I wouldn't be preaching the whole message. I know some of you may not want to hear that, but, but, but I would not be preaching the whole message if I did not tell you if we're not living the way that He's called us to, you are probably scared right now. The thought of Jesus coming back is not a rejoicing for you. But thank God He gives us the signs for warnings so we can turn to Him. Something is brewing. I think we all would be a little naive to say that Something isn't that that there isn't something brewing in the earth today. But what concerns me about the church is that we have spent, when I say the church, I feel like I need to clarify that every time. But when I say the church, I mean the church throughout America and throughout the world, especially America, because somehow we feel like that God is just going to speak to us and nobody else. 
But I do believe God it has a special message for America in this season. In the last few weeks, what concerns me is that many have focused much attention on the wrath that God was going to pour out on Nineveh. But seldom, seldom have we talked about Jonah. It is, see, it is easy to see the moral depravity of America in the last two decades. The speed of moral decline is alarming. Is America due for judgment? Is the world past due for judgment? Absolutely. But maybe, just maybe, God is not trying to get the world's attention as much as He's trying to get His people's attention. Maybe these signs are not about awakening Nineveh as much as they are to awaken Jonah and to awaken the church. We are quick to say America better wake up. But what if God is saying my church needs to wake up? As we look in the book of Jonah, chapter 1, we're going to take a journey through the story of Jonah today. And I'm going to do this, believe it or not, we're going to do this Quicker than you think. But we're going to get through the whole story of Jonah. Jonah chapter 1. Verse 1 through 2. Don't worry, I'm not going to read the whole book of Jonah. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. God commands His first words to Jonah. His command to Jonah was to arise. Go to Nineveh and cry out against it. Why did God give him this command? Why did God want him to say this to Nineveh? It says because their wickedness is come up before the Lord. Because the wickedness of Nineveh has come up before the Lord, he commanded his prophet to get up, arise, and cry out against the city. If you're in this place this morning and you think the slaughter of billions of babies in America has not called up before the Lord, you're sadly mistaken. If you think the sexual perversion and the attempt to pervert our children has, gone, has not gone up before the Lord, you're sadly mistaken. I still love you, but you're sadly mistaken. Our God will not sit back idle forever and allow these things to happen. I'm just talking today. I'm just mentioning the things that are happening to our children. But, but, you can, but that's enough. But you look at everything else and the, and the corruption that is going on in our government. The fact that we're rising up and we seem to be on the fence about Israel right now. And in some states which we make, seems that we're against them and against what they're doing right now. I, I, we, we, we have put ourselves in a position where we might just be like Nineveh right now in this country. And the Lord is commanding Jonah to arise and go to Nineveh. This is God's mercy on display. Throughout the book of Jonah, we're reminded of the mercy of God. God does not just destroy those who sin without warning. He gives every man an opportunity to repent. Some heed to these warnings and some do not. But there is one constant. The God of mercy gave them a way out. The same was true of Sodom and Gomorrah. Remember the angels went in. The angels were sent in. But the corruption of that city wouldn't even allow them to stay. So what was Jonah's response? He fled to Tarshish. Verse 3, immediately in verse 3 it tells us, but Jonah arose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish from the presence, from the presence of the Lord. 
When we resist His call, we are resisting His presence. And I know there's sometimes all to just preach. But I really feel like I need you to know this today. Because sometimes I look mad when I say it. Sometimes I look mad when I'm preaching. But you've got to hear my heart this morning. You've got to somehow find the love in what I'm getting ready to say today. But some of you in this room, God has continuously called you. And you continue to run from the call. You know what God has called you to do. But you have made every excuse in the world not to do it. I want you to know today that when you run from His call, you run from His presence. Let me show you, let me, let me tell you what that looks like. You come to church and you think everybody else is just way too emotional. Because you don't feel a thing. Because he called you several years ago and you have not ran to his calling. You have ran away from that and therefore have ran from his presence. You can't understand why things aren't working out the way that they should in your life. It's because they will not work out the way they should in your life until you find yourself in the middle of His calling. I'm not telling you His calling is easy because I'm going to tell you, I understand why Jonah ran. I'm not telling you it was right. Definitely wasn't right. But I can understand. I get it. The calling is tough sometimes. But it's tougher when you're out of the will of God. Jonah began to run from the place that God called him to. But he also, the Bible makes it plain that he ran from the presence of God. He paid the fare to go the opposite direction from his calling. When any of us seek to flee from God, we always pay the fare and the price is always high. But Psalm 139 says, Where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend into heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there you say, your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. Dick says, being in the presence of God is wonderful to one who loves Him, but a terrible thing if He is an enemy. Exodus 4, 8, we read it a while ago. That was a good scripture. But could God be calling us to look at Revelation 4, 8 as well? The four living creatures, each having six wings, were full of eyes around and within. And they do not rest day or night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. That's where I want to be. I want to be in His presence. I don't want to be found running from His presence. I want to be found in His presence. And they were singing to the one who was on the throne. So while we're looking at Exodus 4.8, and we see Exodus 4.8, and I believe that we should look at Exodus 4.8, but while we're looking at that, there's also a 4.8 in Revelation at the end of the book that tells us that God is still on the throne. He hasn't left. He's in control. But if He's still on the throne, we ought to be running towards His presence and not like Jonah, away from His presence. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Why did Jonah not want to go to Nineveh? Because it was, because it was a dangerous place for him. It was a place of debauchery. It was a place full of sin. It was a place 
where it, you, it took three days to walk, a, walk across it by foot. It was a huge city. It was the capital of Babylon. And now it's the capital of Assyria as well. But both of those empires came against the Jewish people and took them into captivity. Both of them are now today in modern day Iraq. Still causing trouble today. The Assyrians were known for torturing their prisoners of war. Impaling them. Flaying them. And hanging their skin on the city wall. Forced them to grind the bones of their ancestors. Thus erasing their memories. They're known for beheadings and amputation of limbs. It's called the seat of Ishtar. Nana was one of her names, and that's where they get the name Nineveh. It was the center for the worship of Ishtar. Fertility, love, war, sex. The people there in Nineveh were very violent, and there was perversion there. Nahum 3 says, Woe to the bloody city. It is all full of lies and robbery. Its victim never departs. The noise of a whip and the noise of rattling wheels, of galloping horses, of clattering chariots, Horsemen charged with bright sword and glittering spear. There is a multitude of slain, a great number of bodies, countless corpses. They stumble over the corpses because of the multitude of harlotries, of the seductive harlot, the, the mistress of sorcerers, who sells nations through her harlotries and families through her sorceries. Doesn't sound like a place you want to go on vacation. So I can understand why Jonah had reservation. But when God sends you, it doesn't matter where the place is. You better go. Because you're going to be a lot more miserable in the long run if you don't. Nineveh would have took Jonah out of his comfort zone. There's too much risk in Nineveh. There's too much fear in Nineveh. So Jonah decided just to do things his own way. He took a boat ride in the opposite direction. And so what did God do? God sent a storm. And the men in the boat with him were terrified as they called out to their own gods. But meanwhile, Jonah was fast asleep. Can I tell you, just because you're comfortable as you're running from the call of God, just because things are pleasurable in your life as you run from the call of God, doesn't mean everything is all right. Because there might be people around you that are suffering because you're running. The Bible tells us in verse 6 that the captain came to him and said to him, What do you mean, sleeper? What are you doing, sleeper? Arise! Uh-oh. Somebody else told him to arise. Call on your God. Perhaps your God will consider us so that we may not perish. His second command to rise. He had men in his boat that were going to die because of his disobedience. But he was fast asleep. And isn't that like the church today? We're fast asleep hoping that the world will someday wake up. And God is calling to us today to wake up as well. They find out they're casting lots and it was Jonah who was at fault. And in verse 9 he said to them, I am a Hebrew and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. We would say today, I'm a Christian. And I believe that most of us here today sincerely love the Lord. But do we really fear Him? Do you really revere Him enough to follow His call? So Jonah, understanding that he's the cause of this storm, says, throw me into the water. i got to go back and tell you that we sit in churches and think somehow or another we're appeasing God 
by continuing to attend the service. And I'm glad you're here. I'm glad every one of you are here today because you need to hear this word. But I've got to be honest with you that we shouldn't forsake the assembling of ourselves. I'm not telling you not to come to church, but what I'm telling you is this is not enough. There's a call in every one of our lives. And He's called every one of us to go and make disciples. He's called every one of us to warn this world of coming judgment, but we would rather sit and look at the signs and talk to each other about them and how miraculous these things are that we're seeing in the world today while our co-worker is dying and going to hell and we haven't talked to them about it at all. And mention the name of Jesus for them to repent. Maybe the signs that we're seeing is more about the church waking up than it is about the United States waking up. The truth is, most of the people in the United States and in the world could care less about the signs that we're seeing. But the church sees them and the church is awakening to them. The question is, as one of my kids addressed to me this week, what are we doing about it? Who are we warning? Who are we telling about this Jesus that is going to come back and take His people home? Who are we telling about this Jesus that could save them from the life of sin and save them from a devil's hell? What are we doing as the church? So Jonah realizes that his pe the people in the boat are in trouble because of him. So he tells them to throw him off the boat. In verse 16 it says, The men feared the Lord exceedingly and offered a sacrifice to the Lord and took vows. So after they threw him off the boat, they realized that peace came upon the boat and they turned to Jesus now. So something good happened out of all this. But Jonah had to put them through a lot of stuff for them to see how good God is in this moment. Jonah confessed God before them. The men saw his awesome power to calm the storm and as a result began to worship him and vow to serve him. But we know Jonah would not get off this easy. He was intending to just drown and be done. But God prepared a fish for him. In the belly of this great fish, Jonah would repent. In chapter 2, we see that Jonah says these words, When my soul fainted within me, I remember the Lord, and my prayer went up to you, into your holy temple. Those who regard worthless idols forsake their own mercy, but I will sacrifice to you with the voice of thanksgiving. I will pay what I have vowed. Salvation is of the Lord. He understood more God's salvation because what he understood, what he should have understood, we found out later he still didn't get it, but what he should have understood in this moment that God, if God would save him, he could save the Ninevites too. If God would save him, he would save the people of Nineveh as well. He prayed a prayer of repentance, of repentance and then the fish vomited him unto the ground. Revelation 3.16 says, So then because you are lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. In chapter 3, after he spit out into the beach, picking seaweed out of his ears, the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, here it goes again, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and preach to it that message that I tell you. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly Great city, three-day journey in extent. He went to Nineveh and proclaimed a short message. This is all he said. This is all that we have record that he said. It said on the first day's walk, he got there. In other words, he understood, I better just go ahead and do what God called me to do. And then the first day, he went. He got to Nineveh in the midst of all these angry, crazy people and said, yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. There is much historical and scientific evidence that there was a solar eclipse over Nineveh 
around the same period that Jonah was warning them. Forty days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Word must have spread quickly in a town that has our city that is a three days walk because people got the message and they began to proclaim a fast and they began to repent before God. And God in His mercy saved them because of Jonah who had to be forced to do it, but he finally walked in the calling of God. Maybe, just maybe, God's trying to get the church's attention and says time is short and we need to be about the Father's business and we need to be proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ and warning those around us to repent while there is still time. If you count 40 days, I'm, 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 I'm finishing up. If you count 40 days from the time of the eclipse, it will be on Saturday May 18th. 40 days from tomorrow will be on Saturday, May 18th. The next full day after the 40 days is up will be Sunday, May 19th. Why is that significant? It's Pentecost Sunday. I believe God is telling the church this is what I believe God's telling the church. I believe God's telling the church you got 40 days to repent. Now we want America to repent. We want America to change their ways. We want the homosexual to be transformed. We want abortions to be stopped. We want our children to be protected. We cry out for these things, but are we willing to allow God to change us too? There's people in other countries that are willing to die for the sake of Christ. They're willing to risk their lives to go to an underground church. They'll sit on their hands to keep from clapping so that other people, because they want to worship God so much. But then you come to America. And we ask for everyone to give us a cause to worship God today. Sing my song today. Preach me a message that moves me and I might lift my hands and no one is standing outside the doors to arrest you or kill you. In China, we have brothers and sisters that are willing to lay down their lives for the cause of the gospel. But many of us wouldn't lay down our cell phones to keep from sinning. What am I telling you? I'm telling you, I believe, and this is a gift what a lot of prophets are saying right now, but this is what I believe. I believe God is speaking to America. And it's not because... It's not because we're such a great nation. It's really the opposite. It's because we have gone so far away from who He is and we've, we've hung on to entertainment so much, even in the church house, that we forgot to seek after Him. And God is calling the church to a time of repentance. I believe, just like Jonah, He's given us 40 days. But this is what I believe. If we'll repent, a fresh wind of His Spirit is going to blow over our nation. It's not about what people in the world are doing right now. It's about if His church is willing to repent, a fresh wind of His Spirit is going to blow throughout this nation. And we're going to see an awakening like we've never seen before. We're going to see souls 
be saved. We're going to be souls, see souls saved in the grocery stores. We're going to see souls saved in the streets. We're going to be see, see souls saved in the prisons. We're going to see souls saved in your workplace because there's going to be a people who truly repent and give up everything that would come between them and God. Our kids were going to sing this morning, someone's knocking at your door. Somebody's knocking at your door. Oh, sinner, why don't you answer? Somebody's knocking at your door. Jesus calls you. Somebody's knocking at your door. Jesus calls you. Somebody's knocking at your door. You may be here today and you know you're not living right. You know that you have not completely repented of your sins and turned to God. You need to come to Jesus this morning. I'm not telling you that Jesus is coming back tomorrow. I don't believe He is because Jesus said that no man knows the day or the hour. There's too many people looking for Him tomorrow. I don't believe He's coming tomorrow, but He might. He might just come at the unexpected time and come today. You need to be ready, my friend. He loves you enough that He'll chase you down. And if you've got to live three days in the belly of a whale, He'll chase you down. If you've got to be miserable or lay it flat on your back, He'll chase you down so that you'll come back to Him. But wouldn't it be so much better if you took a few steps this morning and said, I want to repent and turn to Him today before I have to go through any more of this stuff. I don't want to go through the chastening of God anymore. I don't want to keep running from His call anymore. You might be here today and you genuinely love the Lord, but you've been running from your call to preach for so long. You've been running from your call to teach for so long. There's some of you in this building, I feel that as all of you me, that you've been called to be an evangelist, but you don't share Jesus with anybody because you're scared and you're running. But he said, you have not gone too far. My calling is without repentance. Stop running from the Lord. My friend, your marriage will not be okay until you stop running from the call of God on your life. Your home will not be okay until you stop running from the call of God on your life. Your mind will not be okay until you stop running from the call of God on your life. Stop complaining about the circumstances and do something about it. You were called for such a time as this. Hey, Daniel, you were called to interpret dreams, prophesy, to seek my face in the midst of persecution, to stand in the midst of lions. Arise! Arise! There's some young ones in here. These Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego's you were called to stand when everyone else bows. To walk in the fire. To walk in the fire if you have to in order for the Son of God to be revealed to your generation. Hey, Peter! you got to hear the love in this, Peter. Whoever he is, get over it! wrong but God would say today you've done wrong but I still need you to leave your nets and preach the gospel and heal the sick Peter hey Saul today you've reached your Damascus road you spent time fighting against me and now it's time for me to use you for, your, for my purpose stop trying to live your life your own way and surrender to God once and for all today. Hey church, arise and go. Come out out of your slumber. Come up out of your slumber.
There's a Nineveh to reach. And God is calling us today.